you all know, or at least should know, that it's going to be implemented in May 2018. And for those of you that are new to data or have been in complete denial and burying your head in the sand, uh, the Data Protection Directive 1995 is changing, or rather has changed and passed into law in May 2016 and needs to be implemented by May 2018, and that's now the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. But you also need to be aware, and many of you are, is that running alongside the General Data Protection Regulation is the PECA Regulation, which regulates anything digital and online. Uh, now that regulation is also being upgraded and is in draft form at the moment, but will become the e-privacy regulation. Now apparently that's also going to be implemented in May 2018, although it's still in draft, it's in the second phase of draft. So it may be a bit more delayed um, than general data protection regulation, but that is running out alongside and has some different tenants. So make yourself familiar with that if you're not aware of it. So uh, we asked you when we did the survey, so how are you feeling about GDPR? And actually, you know what? You're, you're, all, you're all starting to get going. Um, so only 10% of you say you're not prepared. The rest are all in phases of being somewhat making pro good progress and being as prepared as you can be, which is fabulous news. Um, probably because every single time you come to one of these events, we just keep going on and on and on and on about it. It's good to, to know that you've been listening. Um, so there is the regulation. And I have to say, it is a very dry read. Um, so what you get is lots of suddenly data protection experts are popping out the woodwork saying, I can help you interpret it. And they're all saying different things. And there's a lot of gray out there in interpretation. And you ask 10 different data protection lawyers and experts uh, for an answer, and they'll give you 10 different answers, which makes it really difficult for everybody to actually work out what you really need to do. Uh, so, you know, be, be warned, um, there are <coughs> lots of these people around. What we've tried to do is align ourselves to some of the people that we feel are best in class. Uh, so we work with Bristos, who are data protection lawyers working under the, guide, the guidance of uh, Robert Bond, uh, working with Rosemary Smith and Op4, Christine Andrews at DQM, working with DMA and Data Protection Network. McKaylee is on the DMA GDPR hub, and I'm on the Data Protection Network board to make sure we're really plugged in to all of the new stuff that's coming down the pipe. And then, of course, we've got the Chief Privacy Officer that works for um, our global group uh, that is making sure that we're on track as well. So uh, any of this stuff that we talk about, it's not our opinion. We've just gathered it together uh, to help you. So the amount of times I've had a conversation with people saying, well, I'm not going to do anything until the ICO come out and announce exactly what I need to do. Well, first of all, that's not going to happen. Because I don't know whether you've heard, but the ICO have had a brain drain. There's about 30 different, uh, very key people that have all left the ICO in the last few months because big business have said, oh, well, we need a data protection officer. We'll get one from the ICO. Um, and so uh, they've now got very few policymakers to actually write the guidance. And as you know, uh, the consent guidance is the only piece of guidance that the Information Commission Office has put out so far, and that's only in draft. So they've said that won't be completed till earliest early next year, and all the other pieces of guidance, they're not even sure when that's going to happen. So really don't wait around for them to pronounce anything. Um, they're also putting out um, some myth-busting information. There's a blog on their site um, because, again, a lot of people are saying, well, I don't need to implement it anyway because we're going to be leaving the EU, so we'll have our own laws. We are implementing this law. This is definitely going in, into the UK, so um, I'd get ready for it, make sure you're adhering to it. I've also heard people say, you can only get consent for all marketing channels. Again, the Information Commission officer said, well, that's not true. There are actually six legal conditions that you can call upon for processing data. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that a bit later. And then there's all this hysteria. There's going to be massive fines. There are going to be more fines under the, uh, the regulation, and it's up to 4% of turnover. But something to remember is that the um, ICO have never gone to the maximum fining capability that they have under the directive. So the fact that they can fine more under the regulation doesn't mean they're necessarily going to do it. And really, they're not out to catch anybody out. If people are trying to do the right thing, 
they will take that into account. It's only if you really make a big, massive mistake and one of your customers complains um, that are, they, are you going to come to their attention. At the end of the day, this regulation is really good for the customer because we all know data is everywhere now and customer trust in, in how we use data has really gone down. The regulation is just to get that trust back. So, you know, just do the right thing. And, and change your strategy to make sure you're, you're, you're being very informative, that you're clear, the information that people are giving you is freely given, that they feel they have some control and choice, and that, they, that you're being transparent all the way along the line. Ultimately, you just need to be accountable, and that's, going to, that's a key watchword from the Information Commission, Commission Office. Show us that you're taking this seriously. So have a plan. Make sure you keep records to show you how you're uh, tracking against your plan and that you're adhering to the key tenants in it. Look after your data so you don't have security breaches. Upgrade if you think there might be a risk. Make sure you don't keep enough, too much data. As McKaylee talked about, you have to define how long is the right length for, for your business. Check your suppliers are all compliant as well and that they're also taking this quite seriously. And just communicate all the way along the line uh, to your customers and, and across all the different um, companies that you work with. There's lots of resources, there's lots of different tenants that are part of the, the being compliant with the regulation. Uh, some good resources uh, on the Information Commission Office website, uh, Data Protection Network and the DMA. Um, good places to start if you just want to check off where are you against where you need to be. So because the Abacus Alliance is all about sharing data with each other, uh, being able to process data is really important. And as I said, there are actually six legal conditions that you can call upon to process data. Uh, the first four that are mentioned there um, don't really apply to marketing, but if you can make a case, then uh, consider it. It's uh, the bottom two uh, that do apply to marketing, but it's important to point out that there is no hierarchy to these um, uh, legal conditions. You just call upon the one that you think is relevant for the type of marketing that you're doing. It's not consent trumps legitimate interest or anything like that. So the two that are available to you are to use consent, which is opting in, being very explicit, and asking people to freely give information and say, yes, I agree. Now, part of that is you can't pre-tick any boxes. Uh, so you can't make any decisions for people if you are going to choose the consent route. And you will need to choose the consent route for um, things like third-party email, quite a lot of the digital activity that you're doing. But for postal mail, which is uh, what uh, a lot of you are doing when you're sending out your catalogues, you can call upon legis legitimate interest. If you have been uh, sharing data with third parties uh, using an opt-out statement, you can just continue doing that. There are a few extra bits that you have to check off if you are now going to be calling upon legitimate interest. So you need to show that you have actually done a balancing test to say that my interests versus the rights of the consumers are equal. So you're working on the basis that um, I have products and services in my catalogue that I would like to show to the customer. And this is a relationship that we're in, and the customer wants to see my catalogue because they want to buy my products. So we, we have a balance of interest here. Therefore, we're going to be marketing to you. I don't have to ask your permission or your, for your consent, but I do need to tell you what I'm doing. So I need to be very clear with the statement what I'm going to do, and I need to give you the opportunity to say no and opt out. So because the Information Commission Office hasn't had been able to uh, put out any guidance on legitimate interest, the Data Protection Network has worked very closely with the ICO um, on guidance, which is available on their website, uh, www.dpnnetwork. So please look at that. There is also a template um, on how to conduct the balancing of interest test. Now, there are 26, sorry, 22 questions in the template. Um, and fortunately for all of us, McKaylee loves the detail of GDPR, and he's actually taken the viewpoint of you and him saying, okay, I want to share my data with the Alliance so that I can continue doing all the marketing that I do. And he's filled it all in with all the answers that you might possibly want to give. And so this template will be available to you from next week to put into your arsenal, but with a big warning and a caveat to say it's not going to be a cut and paste job. 
This is just a template, an example. You will need to write your own words and make sure that they apply for your business and you're thinking about, is this right for me? If you're choosing to go the legitimate interest route, you can, of course, choose consent for all of your marketing, um, but obviously that will have a, a consequence to how many customers you have available to communicate with. So you need to be clear um, of uh, what you're doing wherever you're collecting data. So all the different places on your website where you're collecting data, um, you also need to tell people when they phone you up if you're planning to use the data for marketing and give people the opportunity to opt out. And you also need to put it on your paper order forms everywhere that it's being used. So for those of you that were at our um, event in March, uh, we actually uh, released some research that we'd done with um, Opt4 and DQM uh, using their Permission Max service. We asked 750 consumers um, what they thought of five different variations of uh, statements to say, would you agree to sharing your data if you were presented with these statements? Um, some were friendly worded, quite benefit led, some were legally worded, some opt in, some opt out. Um, unsurprisingly, there was much higher engagement with the ones that were very, very friendly, uh, friendly worded um, and opt out. 47% uh, higher acceptance. Uh, but if you're in the older age group um, sector, age 55 plus, and you um, target men, uh, this is even more pertinent. That um, research, uh, more detail of that is on our website if you want to uh, look into that. So I have to say, full marks to Mayaka, to uh, Robert and Georgie. Um, I, I, I didn't hear yet. Oh, there's Robert. Well, yes. Well, well done, Robert. It's great to see. The main thing is you need to get doing this now because if you want to use this data beyond May 2018, don't wait until then. And it's great to see that Mayaka have started to put these really nice, clear messages at the point of data collection. So they're saying, you know, for your very own copy of our latest catalogue, simply fill in your details and wait for Posty to deliver it direct to your door in the next few days. Very engaging. Okay, I know what's going to happen now. As we know... Consumers are also nervous about what you're going to do with some data. Some data they don't mind sharing and some data they do. Email and phone is a lot more sensitive. So if you're not going to use it, tell them you're not going to use it. So actually, they have here, we won't share your email with other companies. OK, that's great. I don't mind giving you it then. And we will only share your telephone number with, other delivery, uh, with our delivery service. Um, and at the bottom, it just says very clearly, reminds them again they're not going to share um, with uh, phone companies or email, and that uh, they're actually going to be sharing the data with um, other parties. And then a link to their um, security and privacy policy so you can get more information, and then to double check, send me mine. Love it. So well done, Robert and team. Um, this is an example that we worked on for with um, Opt4 um, to give you, uh, you know, if you, if you want some uh, steer. We think you'd enjoy some of the latest products and offers by posts from our trusted retail partners. Um, then with a link to the privacy policy. And the Information Commission Office loves videos because it's really, it, it helps consumers understand what is going to happen with data. So you can actually uh, click to a, a link to a video which is available to you. And again, we launched that video at our event, event in March. It's a, a, a couple of minutes long, um, and that explains the benefits of sharing data, just in case consumers are not quite sure whether they want to do it. Um, and we will give you the high resolution, high, high resolution file to actually go onto your site. It's not branded, it can be yours. Um, so please use it if you think that's of any benefit. Again, also uh, think about these postal order forms. Um, it's a nice um, interpretation from Kashmir Centre. They've uh, put a third party statement um, under the, the uh, delivery part. And then at the bottom here, they've actually also talked about the fact that they, they're going to continue sending their catalogue um, to the, the customer just to uh, give them extra clarity about what's going to happen. So a lot of you have been saying, okay, so I'm fairly clear about what I need to do with my website, um, but what about collecting data on the phone? What do I say? How do I do it? And so many of you asked us that we went to um, Rosemary Smith from Op4 and Elaine Lee from Reynolds Busby Lee, who was a telemarketing specialist, and we asked them to put some guidance together. So that is now going to be released to you. Um, that's available, I think, today, tomorrow? Next week. Next week. Next week. 
Um, just a few more final checks. Um, but that gives you some guidance on, first of all, how to implement the general data protection regulations um, into your contact centre. So it's all about how you have to explain to your people about why they have to do it, what the impact of the business is if they don't do it, what that means to their role, what sort of things are they going to have to say now that's different than they were saying before. Give re regular training sessions. So don't just do the one training session and let them go. You have to keep reminding them of their responsibilities now and how things have changed. And you need to document how you've made these changes and really make sure that the staff are very bought in and that they're well versed on the benefits of sharing data and the benefits of you collecting data. Otherwise, I've been to many stores and also phoned up contact centres where they say, oh, you won't want to be sharing your data, will you? I'll opt you out, shall I? No. <laughs> um, so we do need to change a mind. There's a mindset to change um, in, for some people. Um, there are examples in the guidance of both opt-in and opt-out statements. So this is not saying you definitely have to have an opt-out statement, but this is the type of things that sing thing that they can say if you do want to go to the legitimate interest route. We may send you special offers by post and sometimes share your details with retailers so they can mail your offers that could be of interest. You can stop these at any time. We'll send you more information about what you might receive and how to opt out with your purchase. And as long as you've got some information in, your, um, in the box with the, your website details, then you should be fine with that. So, earlier on, Michaeli talked about data retention. You can't keep data forever anymore. It says in the regulation you can't keep data for longer than is reasonable. Now, what on earth does that mean? That's down to you to decide what is reasonable to your business, and it will be different business to business. So, to help you, Michaeli and his team thought, OK, well, we've got all of your combined data. Why don't we look at repurchase cycles and say, OK, well, if people are going to buy again, I need to keep their data. But how long does it take everybody to buy again if they're going to buy again? And so what they found was 90% of the average customer will have bought again within the 41 months. So that's four years, two months. So you could legitimately say, well, actually, we're going to keep all of our customer data for four years because we can justify that, actually, they're likely to buy again because here's some analysis that says that right across the industry. Now, that's the average. There are different purchasing cycles depending on which category you're in. The purchasing cycle is longer in gardening than it is uh, in clothing, for example. Um, but what you will probably want to do is do your own repurchase cycle analysis uh, because, for example, here, the clothing average is only three years, eight months. So one of our members have done their own <coughs> cycle analysis and they say, well, theirs is six years. So you want to make sure you've really got the right length of time, but that you've got something concrete to show the ICO if they do come and ask you. Again, there's um, a, a lot more information on that um, on our website, and Michaeli and team can talk to you about that. If you would like us to do it, uh, it's very quick and easy for us to do some repurchase cycle analysis for you. So, uh, so just please ask your account manager if you need that doing. So we've also been making sure that the Abacus Alliance is compliant. Of course, we need to look at ourselves as well as tell you all guys what to do. So we've done a full top to bottom review pro of the processes that we have in our business and we've put it in some GDPR software called OneTrust. Uh, we're very lucky the fact that we're part of this very lo uh, large global group and they have bought this specialist software for us and that logs everything so that if we're ever looked at, it's all there and very clear. As you know, we're looking at all the statements that you're using, and I know many of your account managers have set up meetings with you to point things out that you might want to think about changing, and uh, we're working our way through. And again, if you would like to, to have a session like that, please ask your account manager. We're not consultants, but we, you know, we can give you a few pointers. We have uh, worked with lawyers to actually uh, rewrite the Abacus Alliance Agreement to make sure you're covered under the new requirements and that we're covered under the new requirements. You'll be getting those new agreements to, uh, to check and sign in the next few weeks onwards, um, but we're going to ask you to sign them electronically to make it nice and easy, rather than you have to print it out, sign it, and all that sort of stuff. Um, many of you will also know that from next year there will be uh, fair pricing based on the amount of data that you're sharing. So the people that are taking this really responsibly and are sharing large volumes of, 
uh, of compliant data will get um, more preferential pricing than those that are just not, not, not doing their bit. Um, and a lot of you have actually said, right, in our arsenal, we would like to have um, a document of the security process. How are we looking after your data? Um, so we actually have a full process uh, document that's available to you anytime. Uh, it looks very dry like this, but um, you can actually uh, put that again into your uh, pack. So please ask us about that. So we have lots of resources um, available to our website. I've talked through some of them. Uh, we will continue to develop more if you feel that you need more. The reason why we did the uh, telemarketing uh, guidance was because you asked us to. So again, ask us if there's anything else you would like that's relevant. So to sum up, you can choose between consent and legitimate interest to process data for all of your marketing channels. If you want to rely on legitimate interest to share data, that is fine. I would take action now. I would not wait for any guidance uh, to come out. You broadly know what you need to do. I'd just get doing it um, and, then and then just check it off when the guidance does come out um, and uh, make use of the, the resources because they're all free to you. <laughs>